Hi friends, welcome to yet another video with Cambridge Economics Club. We are here with a good friend from Australia, Dennis Venter, member of Rethinking Economics Australia and founder of EDA. Welcome and thank you for joining. Thank you, good to be here. Before we start talking about how you came up, came up to the idea, please give us a short introduction. What is EDA and what do you aim with it? In short, IDA aims to reintegrate economics with social sciences. And the way that I want to do this, I think is quite unique. Uh, I take a dynamic approach that explains how economic science itself changes. Uh, what I mean is the changing focus of economics is very much a reflection of the changing conditions of the time. So the schools that emerge and gain popularity can't be isolated from this uh, evolving social reality. So in the next few minutes, I want to represent a framework that explains these changes in economics. So, Denis, what does IEDA in IDA stand for? Sure. IDA stands for Integral Economics, a Dynamic Approach. Okay, now give us a bit background and tell us what exactly that is. All right. When you start your undergrad course, you're usually presented with a few definitions of economics, right? But no one explains why they're different. So you might be thinking, are they from different times or what's the story with this? Uh, so after some research, you'll see that it's basically different perspectives or schools of economics. And if you're lucky, you would have discovered rethinking economics at this time or a brilliant source like exploring economics which kind of compares and contrasts these perspectives. But even after that, I felt like there needs to be a bit more to it. I felt like I was looking at different puzzle pieces or a collage and different uh, pluralism was telling me about the shape and color of these pieces and why the pieces are different, but not telling me what picture this builds in the end or how they fit together. And I started thinking, well, what is economics really? It clearly did seem to change a lot with time. So I wondered, why does it do this? How does this happen? What are those deeper mechanisms? So yeah, if you give me a few minutes of your time to set the stage, I'll show you how that works. There's our needs, not just the ones we're currently aware of, but a whole range of things as they develop. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. But the other thing that I wanna show you is the environment, or as I like to call it, the platforms. The market can be a platform that's currently supplying us with the things, the goods and the service that we need. Here I'm referring back to the first variable, which was needs, right? So we've got needs and we've got platforms. Nature is another platform. Think of common pool resources, right? Even things such as the internet is a platform for websites. Websites is a platform for the things that's posted on it. And, uh, if these platforms come into existence, drawing on the platforms that already exist below them and the features of the platforms below them. For example, can people be excluded from what is supplied? Is it about competition or cooperation? Uh, does one person's use of the platform add or subtract to the value that another person can get from using this platform? So these are just a few features of platforms. The whole environment is then a network structure of platforms that uh, supplies us with things. And I say things because it's much broader than neoclassical supply uh, with their understanding of goods and services. The third important one is our culture. So we've got three. One can't exist without the other two. It's almost impossible to explain one of these without referring to the other two. And these three then interact and develop to result in everything that we observe in economics. I'll just condense the stuff here to free up some space because I want to draw a diagram for you. There's your individual. That's you and your needs. And we've got the environment, which is divided into the physical environment or the platforms and the stuff that's the soul of this physical stuff, kind of, like the culture, which includes power, collective beliefs, social constructs, uh, formal and informal rules, and all those things. 
and the individual that's the important part right we can divide this individual into two just like what we did with the environment the physical things like the body and the biological systems and then the stuff that goes on inside of our minds like the individual's preferences needs individual beliefs incentives this is not necessarily in the collective culture but the two are connected all of these are connected and reflections of one another the physical body thing kind of stays constant so it hasn't always been as important but that's about to change if you think of gene editing and neuralink and the changes that that can do to our bodies and the repercussions that that can have on our economies and how we do economics i won't go into artificial intelligence that would be an extra circle to represent the artificial world and the artificial culture that develops within these worlds it would also have a little avatar here which is your body in this ar world and the internal sphere i'm also not going into robots which should be a completely different diagram that interacts with our current one especially if these are sentient but anyway now you thinking how does this picture tell us anything about the different perspectives in economics well let's see how this picture can help us to realize what's really going on with economic concepts scarcity is one such concept without this picture people will say scarcity is about unlimited needs and scarce resources but that doesn't tell us anything someone else might argue and say our needs are limited for example how many apples can you really need each week and our potential is unlimited but then when you look at this picture you realize that each part changes with time you'll define scarcity then as depending on the group of active needs and goals and preferences and the state of the platforms in the environment goals and preferences change so does the environment the rationality is another such concept mainstream economists just say let's assume the individual knows everything meaning they have uh, complete information about their physical environment the platforms and it doesn't seem them as uh, having any cultural constraints or even being limited by what their physical brain can process then someone said okay but maybe someone's rationality is uh, bounded they're bound their mind is sometimes irrational uh, their brain is actual is limited you can't just develop a bigger brain and this we considering a longer stretch of time but that's a story for another day but now taking a dynamic approach would be yes the individual is limit abounded but he can learn new ways of thinking and there are physical things in the environment like calculators uh tape measurers or google whatever they can use and there are concepts that they can internalize for example when we internalize the concept of meters of numbers of kilograms to help us make decisions so our new definition of rationality is a capacity that develops along with the environment the environment changes and becomes more complex and so does our capacity to understand it money is another such concept you can't just put money in one of these areas it's got a cultural side to it the way people think about money it's a, a physical side to it the actual note or the coin or the app that you used to pay and it fills a specific need as a unit of account as a means of exchange and so on but these three parts of money always changes so what money is also changes uh if you go back in history you don't only use different physical things as money but you've got a different use for it based on what you need the money to do and the two are linked and you internalize it you think of every item as costing something in dollar terms so this picture helps us to gain an insight into that complex system of money Yeah so it is an attempt to redefine economic concepts according to these dynamic variables that you see on your screen um so that these concepts can actually then contribute to our understanding of economics otherwise it's like two individuals with different perspectives are talking about the same thing but they might as well be talking a different language probably because they were trained in different parts of the social sciences or economic schools 
or they come from different times, or maybe they're just repeating stuff that they heard without understanding it. So applying this logic to more concepts is revealing what I hope economics can one day be. It reveals this picture that I was hoping to see when looking at the plurality of puzzle pieces. If you think about it, when neoclassical economics forced us to see things through their perspective, that approach was monism. Then came pluralism, and that's a great tool. Who can really argue with pluralism? When you look through different perspectives, you see the world differently. But yeah, what I want to talk about is um, an integral approach where you see economics for what it is, with a, a changing individual in the center of a changing physical and social environment. Wow, wow. So it's about a new way of thinking about economics. Yeah, that's the initial part of the dynamic approach. You use that type of logic when looking at concepts, but on the other hand, there can be system analysis and simulations that actually, that's based on this initial, initial logic that can actually then go ahead and model rationality, model scarcity, and which other, other concept you apply that logic to. Going from that first to the second step, it might be easier than you think. Uh, NetLogo is an intuitive little program that can do that. And with advances in language processing, like ChatGPT, uh, you can use natural speech which can get translated into code for NetLogo to understand. I'll leave that aside for now and just speak about that first part. It's about bringing in concepts that are ignored by orthodox economics and taking the concepts that orthodox economics do look at and making them more real. The goal is to develop a theory of how all of this interacts and uh, causes dynamic change in economics and in our economies. So you can see from this perspective, we don't just study schools of economic thought uh, as pigeonholed next to each other. It's all integrated in a dynamic whole. So let's get into the actual process. That involves asking a few quick questions. When did economics start and what's the definition of economics? Now, to answer this, someone might say, we can turn to the history of economic thought. But that history is still limited in two ways. It, um, it excludes everything that happened before the writings of ancient Greek philosophers. And two, it doesn't fully represent perspectives beyond the Western one. So you overcome the first limit by realizing that if economics is all about your needs and your means, and economizing that process and optimizing it like I showed you in that diagram, then economic coordination started as early as human perspective shifted in a way that inspires an, an individual to change something in the environment. And the new way of interacting with the environment reduces the effort in satisfying a need or provides a new way of doing things like how to manage common pool resources, or we go from hunting to farming. So it ends up creating a new way to do things, new habits form, and new needs in the individual form. And you might realize another problem or goal has arisen, and the process continues, and culture evolves. Another example of this could be coding, uh, making a tool or coding an app, where the tool or app makes life easier, or better or nicer. So as soon as this cycle is present, individuals are economizing and economic analysis is justified. So it looks like a bit of chaos here in the real world on the left, but it can be explained with feedback loops on the right. About this reduced effort in satisfying a need, neoclassical economics will only talk about surplus and put that in a graph or table about this new way of doing things, they will only talk about technical advances. A tool or app, they'll talk about capital accumulation and force that into a production function. So these normal neoclassical terms are really nested in a larger social world. So let's consider it in a broader real sense and include economic thought from other parts of the world to overcome that second limit. 
because, for example, when we studied this cycle in Europe, we called it economics and slapped those terms on it. Um, but studying societies in Africa, we called that anthropology. And then the borders between the social sciences persisted. And then economists started applying their perspective and way of doing things to other social sciences instead of the other way around. Matthew's going to tell us a bit about social sciences and how, how they overlap in a moment. But what I hope to do is create an economics that is integrated, open and dynamic, non one that is isolated. Okay, so what is economics? Mainstream economics uh, courses, they don't consider time in economics. It's got a very Western focus. It trains you to fit that mold. So if you want to get out of that mold and broaden your horizons, it helps to listen to a different story uh, just to help you to realize that there's more out there than this narrow, isolated uh, way of thinking. For this, I'm going to hand over to Ankita. I'm going to present a concept called spiral dynamics. It is a model of human development and collective progress through different value systems. Spiral dynamics can be used to explain the dynamics in how individuals think and act and how this relates to collective change. It is also convenient because unlike the history of economic thought, spiral dynamics starts with early nomadic societies which is when the economic cycle that Dennis told us about became important. So let's get right into it. Okay, nomadic societies. Members of such societies only knew basic needs. The concept of goods and services, as we know, it didn't exist yet. There were only social interactions with others and the basic things that nature provided autonomously and freely. So nature was the platform that supplied us with many of the things we needed. They lived in harmony with the world and valued equality and sharing. And it was precisely that culture and goals which were an important part of their economic systems. Lots remained undiscovered, for example, electricity. And the possibilities that electricity would afford and the changes it would bring. But they did not have a present need for it because they were unaware. After they found ways to change their environment to satisfy their needs easier, the new environment led to new needs and their views of the world and their own possibilities changed. All over the world, private ownership became more common, sharing became less common and empires expanded. Autonomous supply by nature became dependent on agriculture, trade and the expansion of the empire. A need for power became central religious teachings or a type of righteousness becomes popular which is usually a part of the state. It is aimed at creating order between all the elements fighting for power. This also produced the first economists doubling as philosophical or religious thinkers. Here society typically gets divided between those who own land and those who work on land. Even today, spiral dynamics sees religion as something that pulls people and societies out of this mindset that runs rife between empires or in gang striking areas of today's world. It explains the growth of the Catholic Church in Rio today. Then enlightenment brought an end to the dark ages and industrialization changed the rules again. A new platform called companies started to commoditize things into goods and services. The companies do marketing to create a need and they supply it to those who have adequate effective demand. You can see all these neoclassical concepts applicable to this specific value system. The perspective was to work and earn money. The goal was to grow regardless of other costs. Some economists are still stuck here. Our new goal became sustainable development, equity, 
and trying to balance the market with rules. It is important to notice how the success of one value system basically sows the seeds of its own destruction. But also notice how one value system is also the solution to the problems created by the previous one. So balancing the market with rules, animal rights, the triple bottom line, worker rights, taxes to redistribute wealth and so on became popular in this phase. It was a response to problems associated with the industrial age, the expansion of markets, the emergence of powerful companies and individuals who act against the market. Obviously, there are variety here. Not every economy goes through the same value systems at the same time and each value never completely disappears. So where might we be heading to next? Well, today we see supply becoming automated again. In this case, not by nature, but by way of digitization. There is a renewed interest in local production and community. Information is becoming even more important. Economic agents need and consume information that is sometimes free and at other times very costly. Ideas like labor and production functions lost their logic. It is not about output, but rather what is afforded by certain things. For example, consider a smartphone. It can't really be called a good or service in the classical sense. It is a combination of so many things that afford you to do and be part of different things. Many things are free to the user. It is free because it is network supply or because it uses alternative means of profit. In alternative means of profit, questions like who really supplies who and with what becomes more complex. Information changes our perception dramatically and our new goal is to keep up with this information. The economy becomes so creative that it makes economists scratch their heads. So to conclude, Spiral Dynamics exposes the system-wide changes which result when individuals with certain values in societies reach critical mass and when individuals change institutions and their environment to better serve their individual and collective needs. This progress or even regression at certain times is found in each culture's history, in society at large and inside individuals' habits. Thank you guys. Perfect, so each value system that's just been introduced saw reality in its own way. It thought it was superior to the value systems that came before. The perspectives observed in the history of economic thought is not much different. Then with economic pluralism, it's realized that each perspective contributes something worthy to economics, but it's still so pigeonholed. I propose that we need to get to a more dynamic ontology that goes beyond just valuing each perspective. One that also tries to put these puzzle pieces together to highlight these uh, underlying dynamics. It's not important how many stages or value systems there are or how they get divided, just like it's not important how many schools of economic thought there are. The idea uh, with the story that Ankita shared is also not to advocate for spiral dynamics as a philosophical framework, there are many philosophical frameworks marked with these ideas of one class overthrowing another class. There are many others. What's important is to see that our world is, is rich and dynamic and interconnected. So we need to uh, discover what these dynamics are and why they happen. And that requires a type of integrated social science. So I'll hand over to Matthew for a while to introduce his theory of social sciences. Today I'm going to share with you something I made while I was in university and taking various social science courses. About 10 years ago, I found a pattern between some key terms and it has really helped me think about interdisciplinary work in general, but also economics in particular. Economics uses the term incentive. Some go so far as to call it the science of incentives. In older psychology books, you'll find the term stimuli, which comes from behavioral psychology. 
Newer books tend to use signal or sign and take a cognitive approach, modeling the brain after a computer. Signs and signals are terms that frequently come up in communication studies too. Already, we can start to see a little bit of an overlap. Then, in anthropology and sociology, we have the terms culture and social structure. I put these terms together since culture is a kind of social structure, similar to race or gender. For political science, I have a very vague term. I'm not the happiest with it, but we'll use the word power. What I'm going to do now is show how they overlap and how this relates to theory, as well as how interdisciplinary work should perhaps be organized. We already mentioned that in psychology, they sometimes use the word stimuli, and other times they use sign or signal. Signals are frequently used to describe information transmitted between computers and other non-living things. So I place it at the top here. Stimuli, on the other hand, always implies a living organism on the receiving end. While psychologists use one term or another, depending on the camp they fall into, I like using both as they can be used to show whether the recipient is living or non-living. And I think that's an important distinction worth keeping. Next, we also have incentives. Incentives imply an interaction between at least two living agents, and one is trying to influence or motivate the other's behavior. Already, we can see an immediate connection between incentives and motives, as well as economics and motivational psychology. Unfortunately, economics doesn't talk to psychology very much. Once we organize them this way, we can already see a structure and that economics really shouldn't try to boss around other fields. They should be listening to them a lot more. This has been done to some degree. There's behavioral economics, for example, but I don't think they've noticed this. There's another thing missing from their picture and it's communication studies. From this perspective, the entire economy is a giant communication system. Hayek said the same thing about 100 years ago, and it's where we get the phrase price signals. There's good reason then to take communication studies and psychology first before studying economics. Across this dotted line in the center, I'm going to put cultural and social structure to the right. This entire left-hand side is about information and interpretation. Who's interpreting? Who's the receiver? Whereas the right is a structure. It's, it's a container that shapes information flowing through it, if we think of information as a flow of water. Culture and social structure change how we interpret information and shape what incentivizes us. Last up is power, certainly the loosest of the keywords. However, we can think of incentives as a form of power over somebody, like bribing them, the carrot or the stick, if you will. We can hyphenate this as incentive power. Similarly, structural power is a thing. Racism, sexism, and more control large parts of our lives. This is my brief show of key terms across social sciences and how they overlap. I hope this semantic map helps you translate what other social scientists are saying. More importantly, I hope you're more ready to listen after this as well. Thank you. All right, so we're getting a bit closer to what economics is. And I'm going to get back to these key terms that Matthew used in a moment. Um, so we already know that neoclassical economics, they find the answer to their world in demand and supply of goods and services. But goods and services is only a small part of this environment. And since the real world is dynamic, and since other times do not have the environment, the concepts, the goals um, and culture assumed by neoclassical economics, where lies the answers to the real world? So Ankita showed us how dynamic our history is and our future will be. Matthew showed us how social sciences overlap in a Venn diagram or a semantic map. So let's look at our diagram again to see how it forms the basis for where we find the answers to a world larger than that of neoclassical economics. The first variable related to this inner part of the individual is needs. 
not just a specific set of needs considered by orthodox economics, but a whole range of things as they develop that humans can spend time pursuing because all of that uh, influences opportunity cost, time spending and economic decisions. We also don't just consider a snapshot of needs in a specific time, but an evolution of needs. The second variable related to the top half here is that things in the environment P uh, that satisfies all of these needs. So how we define our environment and see us, ourselves interact with what is around us is at the core of economics. Our environment determines what's possible, what's not, it's where we work, play and create. So the orthodox view of the environment focuses on goods and services of industry and government, but there's so much more to the environment that impacts opportunity costs, time spending and economic decisions. So the orthodoxy, it fails to capture everything that has value to us. And I'll make a note of that on the screen here. So P represents a more broadly defined concept applicable regardless of the time that you're in. The third variable relating to the bottom half of the environment is the developing consciousness or collective culture, I, which weaves itself through society. It allows us to see possibilities that others didn't, like the enlightenment that brought an end to the dark ages. Robert Solo once said that all economic activity is embedded in a web of social institutions, customs, beliefs, and economic attitudes. And your, your past experience in your environment determines your perception. So signal that Matthew spoke about between two non-living things could be, for example, in this area. Stimuli could be between this area and the individual. Incentive could be within this area between two individuals. And as Matthew said, uh, culture and social structure change how we interpret information and uh, shape what incentivizes us. Remember how I said the parts of this diagram are all connected? Um, that's easier to see when you're represented as quadrants. You see some labels here. If you want to know what that is, you have to look at uh, Cartesian dualism and Ken Wilber's four quadrant model. But just like before, each quadrant is like a mirror image of the others. Uh, for example, let's take food, say fruit and vegetables. Here as a platform with the farm and the market, here as uh, an individual's need for fruit and vegetables, here you, your body is adapted to eat fruit and vegetables. Here there can be a subculture identifying as vegan or someone identifying as a farmer. So it's really internalized. Uh, food and land and a lot of other things are internalized in our culture in very complex ways and economics doesn't always consider that. And when something changes in one of these quadrants, it's reflected in the other quadrants. It's like an endless game of tennis. So it's the same. This is the platforms. This is the needs. This is the culture. But keeping it as a donut shape, just like Kate Raw's donut, uh, the top here can explain display the physical environment like that, the bottom, the cultural environment like that. And that's a nice distinction. And it's great because it shows the individual and their needs. It's right here in the center of it all. You can also look in the current situation within a single economy um, and the platforms of that local economy, how it relates to the needs of the people and their culture. For example, the Dutch economy or the local economy in Kerala in India. Naomi Moleza used this to analyze poverty in his country, the DRC. So even when you do economy studies, I think this graph is a good tool uh, to help you see the relations within that actual real world economy. What's interesting is how P and M interact given a certain I. The small I indicates a snapshot of the dynamic larger I. Okay, so here's the part of the presentation on how we can let other social sciences integrate with economics using ideas from social sciences in economics, not the other way around. 
So let's see. By applying Gibson's theory of affordances to economics, it can be revealed how needs, environment, and culture interact in the real world. So Gibson's theory has been applied to information technology, design, and robotics, but not to economics. Uh, it was originally introduced in ecology to describe how an animal shapes and is shaped by its environment. Um, but it's perfect to apply to a dynamic economic landscape. It shows how an individuals perceive value in their niche uh, over time. So in ecology, in, uh, each species, humans included, lives in a so-called niche. The niche is different from a habitat. It's not a place. It's a way of life. It's an I. The habitat would be represented with a P. So affordance theory study identifies all the specific things or features of the environment that afford something to the organism, given its niche, which is exactly that concept that we were looking for there when I made that note earlier, that thing that neoclassical economics can't do. So the result is a different approach to our world than what we're used to from the orthodoxy. It doesn't start with a, a representative agent model. It considers everything like a complete picture of everything the organism can spend time pursuing or can possibly need and how this changes over time. So-called features of the environment as applied to economics could be products, services, uh, the internet, events, social media platforms, basically anything that affords something to the individual. So Gibson and Normal explains that in our environment, affordances represent latent possibilities, independent of the individual's uh, ability to recognize them, but always in relation to the individual. For example, transportation, independent of whether the wheel is discovered yet. And these affordances then become active given the physical capabilities of the actors, their beliefs, goals, and past experiences. So although the theory has never been applied to economics, it fits these three variables like a glove. Math slows pyramid of needs as long as this, as well as this um, spiral from spiral dynamics, they both imply that needs are sequential. And so does affordance theory, treating needs as latent in the human psyche with the satisfaction of one need affects a change in perspective, which is an activation of the next. So the theory provides the links between the three variables. It provides the rules of how they interact. So this approach even makes sense when you look at business models. For example, Starbucks is not about the coffee. It's about all the other stuff that it affords to you. It's a collection of events and physical features. So when Starbucks closed a few branches in Australia, it was because people didn't see those affordances. It lied outside of their niche. It was in their habitat, but not in their niche. Or in other words, it was in their environment, but not in their culture. So let's look at that. Um, if there's a known affordance that an individual does not have access to, then that individual has an unsettled need. If there's an unknown affordance, there's not yet a need, then that individual is unaware, like a nomadic society with regards to electricity or the Australians with regards to Starbucks. Um, it's interesting to me because it's like these things exist just beyond consciousness. And when you invent them, it's like it unfolds uh, from the platforms that already exist below it. And then it brings changes to your culture. But to keep things simple, it can be said that affordances are facts of the environment. B, they're unlimited, waiting to be discovered. Uh, so are your needs. N, they are facts of the individual waiting to be discovered. And Affordance is the connection between these two developing realms and the group of active affordances uh, depends on the niche or consciousness I. This whole approach gives a new ontology or meta theory of change where attention is refocused on the variables responsible for change. Neoclassical economics just focus on those transitory phenomena that's a result of this change.
that just explains a snapshot of that basically. So the, the dynamic approach based on these variables and their interaction allows us to describe the real world. Uh, instead of representations of economics that focus on a specific value system during our development or a specific part of the diagram, we can now have a type of a functional definition. Now, to distinguish between all of those economic perspectives that are based on a static snapshot of reality, and I believe neoclassical economics is one of those, let, let each of those be represented with a small letter E, followed by a constant I to represent their specific uh, perspective. The dynamic economics is represented with a capital E. All right. So if you remember that first slide with the definitions of economics, orthodox definitions say economics is a study of unlimited needs and scarce resources. In that constant point of time with a certain set of needs and state of development in the environment. The perception indeed was that economics is a study of endless needs and scarce resources. It was all about that specific subset of needs and from industrial era perception and the specific environmental features that they considered according to their specific perspective represented by active affordances. But since the definition should not just focus on one perspective, economics equals everything from one up to infinity to include all perspectives that could impact our needs and reveal affordances as this whole dynamic system emerges over time. We can represent the summation of small letters with capital letters like that. So economics is a function of our changing needs and platforms. Everything in the economic world, every activity, advance and opinion is the result of a dynamically interactive creative force between our needs and our platforms B and changing perception I. That's our dynamic definition of economics. It's based on integrating social sciences or seeing economics as the middle part of a Venn diagram introduced by Matthew. Um, and it can explain rich complex histories like what Ankita introduced. So from this perspective, N and P are both unlimited with the active part determined by the relevant I. So just like you now understand what economics is with the help of these variables, so you can understand what rationality is, what scarcity is, what supply is, what needs are. So to get a bit deeper, you can read the papers on our website. You can read, you can look at the videos on our YouTube channel. Scarcity is variable. Rationality develops in the world and the mind. Social sciences are nested. We need to integrate them with economics, not colonize it. What I mean is, instead of taking neoclassical economic methodology to explain those social sciences, as economists, we need to see how that changes us. So when doing research, keep the diagram in mind. Keep in mind our development is complex. So I hope um, IDAI can allow the social sciences to integrate with economics. It's an integral approach describing a dynamic whole. So if anyone is interested in this type of new economic thinking that aims to explain the real world we live in, send me an abstract. I'd love to read about that. Thank you. Great. So if you want to get better understanding of IDA and dynamic approach to economics, check out the links in the description or head over to their YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks everyone. Bye.